amazing to be part of a church family and relationships and community is part of God's design for our walk and I'm so excited about the series that we're starting today it's called disciple and disciples got a bit of a play on words we are talking about disciple number one Peter he's the disciple we know the most about he was the one who ended up leading the early church but disciple can also be a verb because God has told us to disciple others and so we're going to be learning about what it means to be a disciple how we make disciples we're going to be learning about the disciple Peter but before I get into my message I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who's sent us your well wishes and your prayers and your love um, we've had an amazing weekend many of you know my son Timon uh, has been engaged and they got married married on Thursday. Um, so we, I am now officially a mother-in-law. <laughs> I signed the documents. It's in law and love because love comes first and love's the most important thing. Yes. <laughs> so I'll be a mother-in-law and a mother in love. And we had a whole lot of fun this weekend. Um, it was really an amazing time just to connect with family. I hope you guys have also had a chance to relax to connect with friends and family, and to really make the most of a lovely one long weekend. There's not enough of them in the year, right? <laughs> and so as we wrap up this long weekend, we're getting ready for the spring season, and that's why we've started a new series. We normally do this about three times in the year where we do a series that is linked with our own life group material. And so we've had some fun putting together some material for you. It is our own in-house stuff. You can listen to Pastor Johan and myself, and we're going to be sharing about some of the events in the life of Peter. And we've designed it in such a way that you can use it in your life groups. Um, you can even start one, impromptu. Just get some friends or family around you, and it's literally plug and play. We'll be reading a, a passage about the life of Peter, and then ask some questions to spark some discussion. And the important part is for you to give it some thought and some discussion and then to apply it to your life. So if you're not yet in a life group, you'll see on your way out, there's a table with all the info about life groups you can join. Take the details, choose one that's in your area or at a time that's convenient for you. We've got family groups, some with children, some with older people, some with women, some with men. We've got all different kinds of groups. So find a group for you. And if you can't, then start a group. We want to have many, many groups as we go through this life group series and through this disciple series this year. And so let's talk a little bit about disciple. Disciple, it's a noun and a verb, and we're going to be studying Peter. Why Peter? Because he's a really interesting character. Almost everybody that I've spoken to said, oh, I often feel like Peter. He had foot in mouth disease. <laughs> Spoke before he thought. He was the kind of person that did stuff. You know, the look before you leap? He leaped before he looked. <laughs> And because of that, he got to walk on water. I'm so jealous. Wouldn't you like to walk on water? He was there, wholeheartedly there, and he got some things beautifully right, and he got some things royally wrong. And when we look at characters in the Bible, we can learn from the things that they did well and from the things that they did wrong. And so I think he's such a human person. And so we've described him this way. He was a fisherman who followed Jesus and was transformed from an impulsive, fearful people pleaser. Remember how he denied Jesus? He was a people pleaser. And he was changed to become a bold, effective leader of the early church. And the question we want to ask is, what could your life, what could my life look like if we followed the true path of a disciple? And that's why I asked you to, to identify yourself. Mm hmm truth comes out. I'll bet you some of you introduce yourselves by your occupation. This is what I do in the week. I'm a teacher, I'm a lawyer, I'm a hairdresser. I bet you some of you introduce yourselves by a family. I'm a mother of two. I'm a father or a grandfather. I bet you some of you introduce yourselves, I hope you did, for your ministry team. I'm part of the hospitality team. I'm part of the, the teen church team. How did you introduce yourself? And what is your identity? 
And that's something we're going to be looking at today is how Jesus changed Peter's identity. Not only his occupation, but his identity at the core of who he was, Jesus transforms that because he's got a plan for our lives. And our occupation and our family status is only a small part of the whole picture of what God has for us. What could we look like if we follow the true path of a disciple? And so I wanna give you a couple of tips on how you can get the most out of the series. We've put some work and effort into this, guys, and I'm really hoping that you're gonna get the most out of it. The first thing I wanna ask you to do is to come every Sunday. We've got seven sermons, this is the introduction, and then we've got six more from here, and then we've got six midweek sessions. So come every Sunday to get the most out of it, and then join the YouVersion Bible reading plan. Now some of you might be going, what? What? What's the YouVersion? The YouVersion is a free Bible app. You can download it from the Apple Store or from the Google Play Store. It is free, it has got amazing resources, and one of the things that they have you can follow our sermon notes on there. Um, so if you open up on a Sunday and you go under events, you can find all of the sermon notes and it's got Bible reading plans. And so we've given you a card, looks like this, you'll get one on the, on the way out if you haven't got one yet. And it's actually got the scanning place where you can join the Bible reading plan for 30 days. Now, if you times six weeks times seven is 42 days, right? We've chosen a 30 day plan so that you can skip on the weekends because sometimes we skip, right? <laughs> so in the next 42 days, 30 days of Bible reading, and it's a really great plan. It's gonna take us through the whole of the Gospel of Mark. Mark is one of the Gospels which tells us about the life of Jesus. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark's the shortest, so come on. If you're new to Bible reading, you can do this. And then Acts continues from Mark and tells us about the early church. And so we're going to be doing that in 30 days. It tells you a little bit of an intro um, to what the Bible passage is about. It's about half a chapter. And then it also gives you, for those of you that want to dig a bit deeper, it's got some really thought-provoking questions and some links so that you can dig a little bit deeper to really get to know the life of Jesus and the life of his disciples. And so read the Bible daily. Get into God's Word. Then... I also want to ask you to go beyond just the midweek content. Connect with the midweek content, whether you're in a life group or in your home with your family. Do it with a friend. Discuss it. But more than that, commit to putting the principles into practice. This is not about head knowledge. This is about actually living what we're learning. And so commit to putting the principles into practice as you learn them week by week. And then I want to add one in, which isn't on our little card, and that is to read the books of 1 and 2 Peter. 1 and 2 Peter was written by Peter at the end of his life. Sometimes I think we, we kind of think of somebody as a static person. We know that one event in their life and that's all that we think about. But Peter was a whole person. There was teenage Peter. There was young Peter when he was following Jesus early on. There was Peter towards the end of Jesus' three years of ministry. There was failing Peter when he denied Jesus. There was restored Peter. There was Peter who stood up and preached the first sermon in Acts and 3,000 people committed their lives. But it doesn't tell you the fine print. 3,000 people, that's a big church that he had to then look after. And they had some issues. You can go and read about them in Acts. He wasn't just looking after the church in Jerusalem. He ended up leading the church as they went all over the known world. And there are some good and some bad things that happened with their cross-cultural ministry. Peter messed up royally. He didn't get it right. And yet, by God's grace, he served God his whole life. And then as he was an older man, he wrote the books of 1 and 2 Peter to encourage us to stay firm, to get it right first time. So let's, let's read those two books as well. And then you'll get this card on your way out. This is not to remind you. This is actually for you to invite others to church because one of the essences of being a disciple is sharing the good news. And we're putting this in your hand to make it really easy for you to share the good news. So take one, take a couple, invite a friend to church, take it to work, take it to your next door neighbor. What about that friend that's been saying they'll come for a while or maybe they've come to one or two of our events, maybe Christmas or the daughter's conference, invite them to church. 
Speaking of Daughters Conference, by the way, the speaking sessions are up online if you want to catch them up, or if you missed it, there's something that you can catch. So who enjoyed Daughters? Yes, okay. It was an amazing event, but the reason why we're following up the event with a series like Disciple is because being a disciple is way more than just events. We can't just be crowds. God wants us to go deeper. And so, are you ready for me to get into God's Word? Let's have a look at what the word disciple means. If you're going to preach a good sermon, you need to go and find a Greek or a Hebrew word, so I'm told. And so I decided to look up what the word disciple means in Greek. And so it means, uh, well, the way that they say it is methetes, and it appears 268 times in the Bible. There's a lot to say about being a disciple. Sometimes it's translated as disciple, sometimes it's translated as follower. But there's an important distinction between being a follower and being a disciple, especially in our modern day where you can follow somebody and unfollow them just with a click on a device. Being a disciple is so much more than that. And the concept of being a disciple is something that was a well-known principle in their day and age, but it's something that's a little bit different in our modern day age. And so I want to try and give you an image of what that really means. So it wasn't just the religious leaders that had disciples, even the Greek philosophers had disciples. And the core of being a disciple was that you would put the principles into practice so that your life would end up looking like your teacher's life. It's a very important distinction. It wasn't just a head knowledge thing. If you want to contrast it, it's a little bit of a contrast between going to university versus going to learn a trade. If you go to university, you can study and fill your head with a whole lot of knowledge, but all that you've got is other people's ideas and the ability to criticize. Unfortunately, there are many people these days who call themselves Christians who've got a lot of head knowledge and a lot of criticism. I want to encourage you to steer clear of their websites because that's not the way that we live our Christianity. Being a disciple is more like studying a trade. So my dad, he passed away last year at the age of 88, but his first profession, and he had several, his first profession when he was 19, he studied to be a panel beater. Now in those days, your cars were built strong and solid, and your car lasted you a long time, and if you had the unfortunate um, incident of having an accident, you would take it to the panel beaters, and they would literally take out their hammers and dunk, 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 panel beat it to get it the, the, the dents out. And then they would come with a film to bring it nice and smooth, and then they would spray paint, which was quite a skill. And my dad used to boast that he was the youngest apprentice who passed his trade exam, and he was so proud of his skilled workmanship. And then he would tell us how it's so important that you've got to leave it for exact right drying time. Because if you spray paint while the filler is still a little bit wet, then the paint's going to bubble. But if you leave it too long and it gets too dry, it's going to crack. And all of these detailed things that you learn, not by reading in books, but by doing, Amen. right? That's what it means to be a disciple. We actually have to be doing it. That's why as a church, we believe it's so important that you get involved in a life group and a ministry serving team because we've got to do it. And not just do it, but do it with others, others who can teach us and so that we can also then help the new apprentices. I think for me, the best illustration I could give for that is an electrician. Do you want an electrician who got an A on their theory exam but has never connected two wires coming to work in your house? No. You want to know that your electrician has learnt skill from somebody who's gone with them and gone, uh, 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 you need to cut the wires neatly there. You need to make sure that you've removed the right amount of insulation. You need to make sure that you've properly connected them and that they're going to be safe. Otherwise, there's going to be fires or worse, right? It's the same in God's kingdom. We need to be apprentices, disciples, who are learning from our master. And so we see that concept of being a disciple was something that they understood and we need to apply it to. Coming back to the Greek word for disciple, a couple of interesting things. How many disciples did Jesus have? Anyone want to guess? Some say 12. Any other guesses? 
Some say 12. Any others? Anyone who go, go with 70 or 72? That talks about the 72 that Jesus sent out of his disciples. Anyone want to go with how many were in the upper room waiting? 120 were in the upper room waiting, right? They were all called disciples. Disciples. Powerful word that, disciple. How many disciples did he actually have? Well, I want to show you in Acts 19 verse 1 that the disciples were not just limited to the people who had first-hand knowledge of Jesus. It went multi-generationally. This is what it says. When Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples. Disciples. Why were they called disciples? Because they were faithful to the teachings of Jesus. Even though they had never seen him firsthand, they were disciples. And in the same way, generations later, we can be disciples. Proper disciples who are going to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn from him and help one another by teaching and being taught by one another. That's the word disciple. It's also got not just the male version, but the female version. In those days, it was unusual because a lot of stuff was reserved just for men. This is what it says in Acts 9.36. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas, and she was always doing good and helping the poor. And that's the Greek word, methetria, which is the feminine word of disciple, a female pupil. We also see it with Mary and Martha. Remember the encounter with Mary and Martha? Martha wasn't just upset that Mary wasn't helping in the kitchen. Martha was upset because Mary went to sit at Jesus' feet like a disciple, learning, being taught by Jesus himself. She's like, that's not a woman's thing. And Mary was like, oh, yes, it is. It's for men. It's for women. And it's multi-generational. And we get to choose if we're going to be disciples or if we're just going to be followers. So, as we start this series, I want you to get a picture of who Peter was. And not just who Peter was, but who did Jesus choose to be his closest 12? Because he had many disciples. So I'm going to show you a clip. And I want you to have a look at it to consider who would you have chosen if you were Jesus. Remember, he's God. He knows everything. He comes to earth. Who would you have chosen to lead the church? Mm -hmm. Who would you choose? Would you choose the clever people? Would you choose the practical people? Would you choose the nice people? Would you choose the, who would you choose and why? So this is, is a clip taken in Simonstown. And I think it explains beautifully the kind of lifestyle that Peter had been living up until this point. And I'm fascinated to think that Jesus would be walking along the shore and these are the kind of people that he would choose to be his disciples. I'm going to ask you after this, why do you think Jesus chose them? Let's take a look at the clip. Thank you. 
Summer, you're regretting that you didn't go to the sea for the long weekend. <laughs> I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I want you to come up with as many reasons as you can think of. Chat to one or two or three people around you. As many reasons as you can think of, of why do you think Jesus chose them, fishermen? Why do you think? Some of you little, looking a little amused. Some of you looking a little puzzled. I'll tell you some of the reasons I came up with. They're not afraid of hard work. They don't have any airs and graces. They're ready to get right in there. They're not fancy snobs. They're real people. Um, they know about teamwork, right? It's not about the individual results. They need to work as a team. It's messy and smelly. They're not afraid of messy, smelly stuff. Church work, yeah, there's some hard work. There's some stuff that's not so pretty. Jesus told pe cho chose people who already had that foundation to be his disciples. They're not that kind of social media fake, <laughs> fake pretty. They're real people. And I want to encourage you to be a real person, just like Peter, because God can use real people who are ready to do some hard work to get practical. So as we look at this character study of Peter, we're going to look at some of his life events, but more than that, we're going to look at how his character develops, because all of our characters should be developing as we get older. We're also going to look at some positive examples that we can follow and some negatives that we can learn from him. So let's have a quick look at what we know about Peter. Firstly, he was a fisherman. In those days, it was a family affair. You did what your, parents, what your parents' profession was. So he was a fisherman. And secondly, he had a brother, Andrew. In fact, Andrew was a disciple of John. And then Andrew was directed to Jesus after John baptized him. And then Andrew went to call Peter to say, come, we found him. You're going to hear some more about that next Sunday. Don't miss it. Amazing sermon that Pastor Jay is bringing next Sunday about the relationship between Peter and his brother Andrew. Andrew, who started the event, and then Andrew, who ends up second. Hmm. Anyway, he had a brother Andrew, and they lived in a town called Bethsaida in Galilee. But during the period of Jesus' ministry, they lived in Capernaum which is northwest of the Sea of Galilee. So if you have a look at the map, you can see the Sea of Galilee, and then above that is the Jordan River, and Bethsaida is just to this side, and Capernaum just to the other side. So they would have been right there when John was baptizing in the Jordan River and when Jesus was baptized. Do you want to have a look at what it looks like? I would love to go there. In fact, I think maybe I'm called, called to that kind of ministry. Don't you think that would be nice? Have that as your view every day? Jesus had some wisdom when he decided where he was going to be. <laughs> this is another, another picture with the fishing boats. This is still like that today. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah. That was where Peter lived and where Jesus came and called them. Peter had a family. We know that he was definitely married because he had a mother-in-law. doesn't tell us who his wife was or what happened. In The Chosen, those of you that enjoy watching The Chosen, they've given her the name Eden because we know that she, he was married, but we don't know much about her. We don't know when she died, but tradition has it that she served alongside him during his ministry years, and that she was actually crucified in front of him. How awful to pay that price. So, Peter was a family man. They lived 
in what was very common in those days where they had several families that lived together. And let's have a look at Mark 1. This is what it says. It says, after Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, they went to Simon and Andrew's home. So the two brothers had their family home. And Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. They told Jesus about her right away. So he went to her bedside, took her by the hand and helped her to sit up. Then the fever left her and she prepared a meal for them. So guys... Be nice to your mothers-in-law, okay? I'm a mother-in-law now. I get to make mother-in-law jokes. <laughs> His age. He was born probably in about AD 1. He lived in Bethsaida initially. And then he died between AD 64 and AD 68, aged between 62 and 67. Have you considered Peter as a 60-year-old? He's learned some stuff. He's walked with Jesus, he's seen Pentecost, he's preached, he's led the church, he's learned some stuff. This is what he writes in 2 Peter 1 verse 3. He says, this letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ our God and Savior. Isn't this a beautiful blessing? May God give you more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. That's my prayer for you today, that God will give you more grace and peace as we grow in our knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. And then this is one of my favorite promises. He says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. And we have received all of this by coming to know him the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. That's what Peter writes as an old, mature church leader. And that's my prayer for you today. So that's the end of his life. I want to look at two key events at the beginning of his, his recorded life to see what we can learn from him today. The first one was when he, together with the other 11, were appointed as church leaders. And this is what it says. One day, soon afterwards, I think it was after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. This was a serious decision. He had disciples, but he had to choose the leaders who would lead this movement once he was gone. He prayed all night, and at daybreak, he called together all of his disciples, all of his disciples, so there were lots of disciples, and he chose 12 of them to be apostles. What is an apostle? An apostle is a messenger, somebody who's sent on a mission, somebody who's pioneering. And so the 12 that we often call disciples are actually the 12 apostles. My dad used to call them apostles because there's a T in there. I said to him, Dad, it's a silent T, like whistle, apostle, not apostle but he still called them apostles. So you can call them apostle or apostles. <laughs> These are the names. Firstly, Simon, whom he named Peter. So we see that something happened there. His name was changed from Simon to Peter. Then Andrew, Peter's brother. Doesn't that annoy you when you get known by the person that you're related to? I used to go to school and fetch my boys. Hello, Simon's mom. I'm like, okay, great. The wedding, guess who I was? Timon's mom. Yes, so there's Andrew, Peter's brother, James and John, four fishermen out of 12. A third of them fishermen, right? Philip, what do we know about Philip? Philip was probably CEO material. He planned ahead. Remember with the feeding of the 5,000, he'd already calculated how much they would need and how much it would cost, and he said it's gonna cost a year's wages. I think he was probably quite a big boss. He's the one I would have put in charge. So there was Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Matthew? Tax collector Matthew? You know the one who partnering with the Romans that we don't like? The one who cheated others? Interesting, they didn't let Matthew look after the money because they knew. This is the life group that Jesus put them in. Do you like all the people in your life group? Have you maybe got a Matthew in there? A bossy Philip, maybe? 
Maybe you've got the clicky fisherman in your life group. Then there's Matthew Thomas. Ooh, you've got to have a Thomas in your group. Are you sure that's what it means? Is there proof? Is there evidence? You've got to have somebody in your group who's Thomas who's going to ask the hard questions. James, son of Alphaeus. Simon, who was called a zealot. Do you know what zealots are? Zealots are political activists, terrorists. The zealots were trying to overthrow the Roman Empire and they would take these short daggers in their cloaks and they would go to crowded marketplaces and they would stab the Roman officials. They were terrorists. This guy had a political agenda. He wanted Jesus to overthrow, overthrow the Roman government. Have you got somebody who's political in your life group? Mm, you've got to have a zealot in there somewhere. Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. I'm sad to say, but the chances are good that somebody in your life group, somebody in your ministry team is going to cause hurt at some point because we are human. And when God puts groups together, he knows exactly who to put together because he needs to shape us and mold us through our life groups, through our ministry teams. Don't leave your life group because you've got some funny people in there. Okay, God puts groups together. And this is what it says. When they came down from the mountain, so now he's appointed his 12 leaders, they came down from the mountain, the disciples stood with Jesus on a large area surrounded by many of his followers and by the crowds. There's three categories of people in those days, and I think three categories of people who come to church. Disciples, followers, and crowds, and of the disciples, some of the disciples are then leaders, right? Where do you fit in? Are you part of the crowds that came to Daughters Conference and now you came to check out the church today to see, is this worth it? Are you a follower? You like know what's going on, you're there when it's the nice stuff, but you're not there when it gets smelly or dirty. Or are you one of the disciples who rolls up your sleeves and gets into the water? You don't mind a bit of sea spray. You don't mind a bit of smelly fish when it comes to the hard work because Jesus said, I'll teach you how to fish for people. Yeah. It says that the people had come to hear him, to be healed of their diseases, and those traveled by evil spirits were healed. They were disciples, they were followers, and they were crowds. And just like in those days, we need to hear from Jesus. We need to hear his word. We need physical healing. And I think the evil spirits that they often talk about parallel so much of what's going on in people's souls and spirits at the moment. We wouldn't call it being oppressed by evil spirits, but maybe we'd use words like mental health issues or anxiety. When people came to Jesus, he taught them and he healed their bodies and he cared about their souls and their spirits too. And that's what church should be. We should have some crowds. But crowds need to convert to become followers, regular attenders. And followers, I'm hoping, are going to become disciples that say it's not just about hearing, it's about practically getting involved and learning. I want to, before I read the rest of this passage, one more passage for you, I want to just quickly talk about what discipleship is. Because we've wrestled with that. How do you know if you are making disciples and how do you know if you're being a disciple? And so this is the definition that we've decided to use because it's really practical and it links in with growth track. If you haven't done growth track yet, by the way, 11 o'clock. Don't miss it. Growth track. Discipleship is an intentional process of spiritual growth through encouragement, scripture, prayer, and practical next steps to become more like Christ. Discipleship doesn't happen by accident. You have to be intentional about it. You have to choose it. It's spiritual growth, not knowledge. It's spiritual growth. And the purpose is to become more like Jesus. Not so that we can know more, but that we can be more like Jesus. And the four things that God used in their little group of disciples and which he uses in our ministry teams and in our life groups, four things. Encouragement. We need to encourage each other. We need to be encouraging, and we need to be here so that we can be encouraged. Encouragement, scripture, everything starts and ends with scripture. We need to know God's word. Prayer, we need to spend time hearing from God and bringing our needs to him. 
and we need to take practical next steps. We need to know where we are and we need to know what we haven't done yet. What's your next step? What's your next step? For some of you, you're here as part of the crowd. I'm hoping that you become a follower. For those of you that are followers, I'm praying that you're going to become a disciple. And for some of you, you've been a disciple for a while, and maybe God's calling you to step up as a leader. What's your next step? Let's take those practical next steps as we grow. And so as we close, I want to share another significant event in the life of Peter. And this is the day that Jesus changed his name. And I want you to look out for how Peter recognizes Jesus' identity. And when Peter recognizes Jesus' identity, then Jesus gives him a new identity. So Jesus had asked them a question. He says, who do they say I am? And the disciples answered. Some of them say you're a prophet. And then he asks the most important question, who do you say I am? And I want to ask you, who is Jesus to you? Is he somebody who teaches well? Is he a wise person? Is he somebody that heals? Is he somebody that you're asking for provision? This is what Peter responded. He said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. The Messiah, the one they'd been hoping for, the one that had been prophesied about, the one who would change everything. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. We don't get it because we're clever. The Holy Spirit reveals it to us. And we need to ask him to reveal things to us. He says, you did not learn this from any human being. And now, because you understand who I am, now I say to you, you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. He changed his name. Simon, it was a popular male name for Jews in that time. Simon means somebody who's hears, who's listening. It was a Hebrew name. It was a name that meant he was open to the things of God. Are you somebody who says, Lord, speak to me, I'm, I'm listening. Because when we're listening, he can reveal himself and then he can change our names to what he wants us to be. Amen. He needs us to be disciples and leaders who are going to change the world. He needs us to be the ones who are going to take that good news to others. But it starts with that attitude that Simon had of listening and then when he realized who Jesus was, he was able to then say, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus could give him his assignment. What is your assignment? What do you believe God's assignment is for you? We've got to listen first. And we've got to be willing to take that next step so that he can then give us our assignment. Why don't you bow your heads as we pray? Lord Jesus, thank you that you are here with us in this room. Lord, you spent 33 years on earth, three of them with disciples. And much of that time with your close 12 developing leaders. Lord, help us to see what we need to know from the life of Peter. But more than knowing what happened with Peter, Lord, help us to have that heart of Peter, to be a true disciple who will listen and who will experience the revelation that only your Holy Spirit can bring. Lord, I pray for every person here that you would open up our ears, that we would hear from you, that you would reveal yourself to you, to each one of us. As Peter wrote in the book of to Peter, Everything that we need, we get by coming to know you. Holy Spirit, would you show us Jesus? Would you reveal him to us as a Messiah? Everything that we need. 
Would you show us how to be his disciples and to follow his example and to be transformed? And for those that have been part of the crowd, who've just come to hear and maybe are needing a touch from God, Lord, I pray that we will become followers and that followers will become disciples and that disciples will become leaders. Lord, will you transform us right now? And as you're having a conversation with God right now, this is a moment for you to just speak to him, bring him whatever it is that's worrying you. Maybe there's something that you feel that's holding you back. Maybe you're feeling that there's something that's tripped you up. Maybe you're feeling like Peter, that you've let him down. Just take a moment and let him reveal himself to you. Maybe you're in the room right now and you've never made a commitment to follow Jesus. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. It's as simple as saying a prayer where we confess that we need him and we ask him for his help. And I'm going to pray that prayer aloud in a moment. But before I do, I want to ask you to be bold. If today is your day to become a follower of Jesus, I want to ask you to raise your hand nice and high so that I can pray that prayer with you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. His hand's going up all over. You can put your hands down. I'm going to pray this prayer, and I want to ask us all to pray it aloud together to help those who are saying this prayer to commit their lives. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came. Thank you that you died for my sin. Thank you that you have a plan for my life. Please forgive me for going my own way. I ask your Holy Spirit to guide me. And today I commit my life to you. Teach me, Lord. Transform me, Lord. Help me to be your disciple. I trust you that you will never leave me until your work is complete. Amen.